Welcome, I'm Rose Aguilar, and this is your Calls Media Roundtable. Yesterday, Vice President Harris had a closed-door meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. She then made a statement. So I just had a frank and constructive meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu. I told him that I will always ensure that Israel is able to defend itself, including from Iran and Iran-backed militias such as Hamas and Hezbollah. From when I was a young girl collecting funds to plant trees for Israel, to my time in the United States Senate and now at the White House, I have had an unwavering commitment to the existence of the State of Israel, to its security, and to the people of Israel. I've said it many times, but it bears repeating. Israel has a right to defend itself, and how it does so matters. Hamas is a brutal terrorist organization. On October 7, Hamas triggered this war when it massacred 1,200 innocent people, including 44 Americans. Hamas has committed horrific acts of sexual violence and took 250 hostages. There are American citizens who remain captive in Gaza. Sagi Deko Hen, Hirsch Goldberg, Poland, Idan Alexander, Keith Siegel, Omer Nutra, and the remains of American citizens Judy Weinstein, God Haggai, and Itai Hen are still being held in Gaza. I have met with the families of these American hostages multiple times now, and I've told them each time they are not alone and I stand with them. And President Biden and I are working every day to bring them home. I also expressed with the Prime Minister my serious concern about the scale of human suffering in Gaza, including the death of far too many innocent civilians. And I made clear my serious concern about the dire humanitarian situation there with over two million people facing high levels of food insecurity and half a million people facing catastrophic levels of acute food insecurity. What has happened in Gaza over the past nine months is devastating. The images of dead children and desperate, hungry people fleeing for safety, sometimes displaced for the second, third, or fourth time. We cannot look away in the face of these tragedies. We cannot allow ourselves to become numb to the suffering. And I will not be silent. Vice President Harris went on to talk about the deal on the table for a ceasefire and a hostage deal. She said the first phase would bring about a full ceasefire, including a withdrawal of the Israeli military from population centers from Gaza. In the second phase, the Israeli military would withdraw entirely. She says that would lead to a permanent end to the ongoing assault and all hostages would be released. On yesterday's show, we talked about whether a Harris administration would be different from a Biden administration. You can find that show at KALW.org. Click News and your call. On today's show, we are talking about what is happening in the West Bank with a focus on the maternal health crisis. In February, today's guest, award-winning investigative journalist Lindsay Billing, traveled across the West Bank to speak to 28 midwives in 11 maternity wards in the cities of Ramallah, Nablus, Hebron, Janine, and Tulkarm. She talked about the significant disruptions to their work since October 7th, as both they and their patients struggle to safely access health care facilities. It now takes much longer to access care because of severe restrictions on patients' freedom of movement, including checkpoints, roadblocks, and curfews. Lindsay Billing wrote about her reporting trip in a Mother Jones piece called West Bank Midwives Are Facing a Maternal Health Crisis. As Israel tightens restrictions on movement, Palestinian mothers are paying the price. Hi, Lindsay. Thank you so much for this important investigation, and thank you for joining us. 
Hi, Rose. Thank you for having me again. Well, it's great to have you back. You visited these cities in the occupied West Bank as the assault on Gaza was happening not too far away. What really struck you the most as you traveled around? Um, I think it it's, was a difficult trip because um, I think just seeing where everything is in the West Bank right now um, And, of course, what we wrote about in the piece, as you mentioned, these kind of restrictions to movement and new checkpoints and obstacles and obstructions in in whatever form they might take. And and I want to highlight that that these have always been there, um, but that they are much worse now since since October 7th. I am. I moved to Israel after the second intifada and I was there for, for seven years. So growing up, I kind of saw, I guess you could say the West Bank back then and, and then, um, seeing it again now, um, these kind of obstacles that not just the healthcare workers face, but everybody faces, um, the changing to the infrastructure, to the geography in terms of, uh, of new roads and blockades to other roads. Um, has just grown significantly worse, Um, definitely worse since October 7th. Lindsay, journalists are still not allowed to go to Gaza. Are you, were you able to freely travel around the West Bank? Yeah, I was able to um, travel around the West Bank. Of course, uh, uh, navigating the roads is difficult. You know, one one day one road might be open and the next day there is a temporary or new military checkpoint on it and it's closed um, or the road might be open. And, you know, I was traveling, for example, down to Hebron south from Ramallah um, through what we, one checkpoint we call the container. Um, and there was a main road which connected a lot of Palestinian villages around the center of Hebron to the center. And it's just completely closed off with, with big boulders now. Um, and that was the road we were going to take. So it can really, it's, it's, it's very quickly changing the, the roads and the access. But yes, I could travel, um, freely. I was traveling with the midwives themselves, um, for this reporting and, and for this story. Um, and also with their husbands who uh, almost every midwife I met, their husband was also a, a doctor or a nurse or, or a healthcare staff. So, um, I was traveling with them to see how their routes were changing, how the time was changing on, at, how long it would take them to get to work, how they could even get to work. Um, but yes, we, we were able to, I mean, they know the back roads. They, they, they get calls every 30 minutes, letting them know which road is open and which is being closed and where to go. It's just constant changing and adjusting to, to these new military uh, blockades to the roads. You write that expectant mothers you met on the maternity ward told you that they were waiting for hours in labor, inching through checkpoints while others found themselves turned back by unexpected road closures. One woman actually gave birth in the car at the checkpoint outside Ramallah, where she had been stopped just weeks earlier, and few can afford the cost of an ambulance. Some pregnant women have started arriving at the hospital before their due date for fear of not being able to make it in time when they go into labor. And you also point out, and this is really important, Dr. Hadil Yusuf Masri, head of the Women's Health and Development Union, a unit in the Palestinian Ministry of Health, says that the prevention of safe access to maternity wards threatens hard-won progress in the West Bank over the past two decades in getting women to give birth in medical facilities and will cause an increase in maternal morbidity and mortality. So can you tell us more about what you heard from Dr. Masri and then the expectant mothers you met who said that they have to wait for hours or sometimes they try to arrive far in advance. Yeah. I mean, a lot, uh, the mothers that I met in Hebron, for example, um, one of them, it had taken her three hours to get to the hospital on a route that would usually take her about 30 minutes um and as almost as soon as they arrived at the hospital and i and there's someone else in the story who also talked about this but uh as soon as her and 
her mother arrived at the hospital, the grandmother, um, they're they're trying to figure out how they're gonna get home, right? And and it's this thinking of like this this never ending constant trying to work out how do you, how do you safely get to the facility first and then and then how do you get back? Um and Dr. Hadil Masri is, you know, was really, really interesting to talk to because she's kind of seen the years of uh struggles of of how do we provide care and and adequate care and quality care to Palestinian mothers who live in in these kind of sprawling villages around city centers and and amidst um you know this ever changing landscape of of checkpoints and and control over uh Palestinian areas and and villages um and so she's kind of seen years of this and for her and and for other healthcare staff who who've been working in this area for a long time um seeing this deterioration you know for her it was a, a lot of frustration right um they have these hospitals and city centers both government and private to provide care to mothers and and uh, women and mothers can't access it. And when I first spoke to her, it was, I asked her how many women are going to give birth in the next month, uh, estimated. And she said about 7,000 women across the occupied West Bank. And then when we published the story, which which was last month, it was, uh, I think, 8,000 women were due to give birth. So these are thousands of women um, that, you know, and you don't know when the birth's coming, who need to access um uh, safely access uh, a hospital and they're trying to encourage women to give birth in a hospital like like you mentioned um and women don't feel safe going on the road and driving through a checkpoint and not knowing how the soldier is going to treat them that day or not knowing if they're going to get turned back or not so uh, other women and I spoke to said no I'm I'm staying at home I'm going to give birth at home because I don't want to risk going on the road or being turned back and giving birth on the way or having to go to an emergency clinic um and not having access to my family so yeah they're also in fear of being attacked you write that the past 8 months have seen an unprecedented unprecedented rise in Israeli attacks on Palestinian health workers not only in Gaza which is facing a maternal health crisis of its own amid the collapse of its hospital system but also in the West Bank where the World Health Organization reports that there have been more than 360 attacks on healthcare staff and facilities since the beginning of the war Israeli forces have blocked ambulances from reaching critically wounded people, sometimes stopping and searching them. Medical staff have been targeted inside of the hospitals where they work. They've been stopped at checkpoints, harassed, beaten, and detained. You report that a total of 58 health workers have been detained. 10 have been killed. 62 have been injured. This is according to the WHO, a report from February. So what did you hear from the midwives about how they also navigate potential attacks? So it, it's, it's even crazy to, to hear you say those numbers again now, because it's like I looked up uh, earlier this week and, and the number of total attacks on healthcare in the West Bank is now up to 480. Wow. And the number of ambulances being attacked went from 200 to 319. So it's just jumped massively. Um, from the midwives themselves, one of the things that was, I don't want to say surprising, but uh, you know, something that came up repeatedly with with all of the midwives I spoke with was that they don't um, want to show um, their medical card or their medical passes in the front of their car when they're driving through a checkpoint or driving on the roads to their workplace, to the maternity ward. They don't want to drive in their own cars with medical passes because they think that they that that is more of a risk for them, that they are being targeted for being healthcare workers. So instead of that, they are now traveling to work in this combination of taxis and buses and then another taxi again, which, of course, is, you know, it, it's there's something really bizarre in it that they have these medical passes. They are healthcare workers, but they feel that that is the thing that is not protecting them now. Um, and, yeah, uh, as you said, these, uh, you know, getting harassed uh, at the checkpoints, multiple midwives told me about their husbands being taken out of the car and beaten at checkpoints. There have been numerous reports, um, even from the Palestinian Red Crescent recently, about their staff being targeted in their ambulances. 
um, the healthcare staff in general and the midwives all unanimously said they do not feel safe now and, and they didn't feel safe before October 7th, but particularly since the situation has gotten worse. You start your piece by introducing us to Naveen uh, Dragme. She works in one of the busiest maternity wards in the West Bank. And she said, quote, it doesn't matter that we're doctors, nurses, midwives, paramedics. Our medical cards mean nothing. This is our life. We have no safety. We are truly under attack here. First, because we're Palestinian. And second, because we are healthcare workers. She told you that her doc, uh, her husband, who is a nurse, was beaten up, taken out of the car by two Israeli soldiers and beaten up. When you think about these numbers that are going up so drastically, what what do you think explains this, Lindsay? Do you think it's because most media coverage is on Gaza and we're not really hearing much about the West Bank? I think, uh, you know, definitely a lot of media coverage on Gaza is on Gaza, and rightly so. But I think that the exact same time that you know, since since October 7th, everything that was happening in Gaza, you had this kind of parallel incidents and things going on in the West Bank, and it just escalated at exactly the same time. There was an increase in the number of raids in in, uh, in the cities, um, or what Israel would call search operations. Um, there was an increase in this these attacks on healthcare facilities and on healthcare workers in the West Bank. But I think but as you say, there's a lot of attention on Gaza, as as it should be. Um, but this is something historically that you see. We saw it in 2021 uh, with Gaza in 2014 and 2008. Almost every single time that there it, it there is this surge and there is a, a this all these things happening in Gaza and and, and outbreak in Gaza. You see this uptick in the West Bank also. So you see a crackdown um, in the West Bank. You see an increase in checkpoints. And you see um, how the already lack of movement is even more severely impacted. It's the same with the arrests in the West Bank. You see huge numbers and higher numbers of arrests in the West Bank whenever something is going on with Gaza. And historically, this this has been the case uh, of course, very, very unfortunately so. Today, we're speaking with award-winning investigative journalist Lindsay Billing about her reporting trip to the occupied West Bank in February, where she spoke with 28 midwives and 11 maternity wards. Her piece is called West Bank Midwives Are Facing a Maternal Health Crisis. As Israel tightens restrictions on movement, Palestinian mothers are paying the price. Lindsay, why are so many healthcare workers being attacked? What do you think explains this? Uh, I can only, <laughs> I can only explain what we, what the women have told me in the piece. They feel that they are being targeted for being, for being healthcare workers. Um, they feel that they're being targeted for the, for the care that they provide. Um, uh, and, and because that is their job. Um, I th- think that, you know, like we've heard of the first responders and, and the ambulance workers who also go out to, Treat those who've been injured or wounded um, in the in the raids as as well that have been increasing in in cities across the West Bank, um, and and them also being targeted while they are en route uh, to go and collect the wounded. And I think particularly for the midwives, there is this you know all of the health workers in general. This is a job that they. Uh, will do regardless of their circumstances and in many ways these are circumstances that unfortunately they are uh, have seen before um but you know it reminds me a lot of you know of afghanistan also and the way the doctors operated in afghanistan this this uh idea that the doctors will treat anyone wounded in any circumstance and and they will keep doing their work because that's their job you know they always the last person to stop and I think that's why I wanted to do this piece, really, because these midwives are working round the clock. Um, they are understaffed, under-equipped, um, and they are being targeted. But they know that their community needs 
them and women need somewhere safe to give birth. So they keep going. And, and as you report, this really does create a community for so many of these women. This really struck us. You write that beyond medical needs, the maternity wards offer a safe space for the women, many of whom have lost husbands, fathers, brothers, and sons to the conflict to share their feelings and process trauma. Naveen Dragma said, quote, so much more than just health care is at risk with the situation we are in now. So what else did you hear from women about what this space really, how, how important this space is? Maternity wards are, maternity wards are really special in general. There's something like I've, I've spent time in a lot of, a lot of different maternity wards, but mostly in uh, Afghanistan and, and Iraq and, and now the West Bank too. But they are a very special place because they are one of the few spaces really um, where you see, you know, women are completely open in where they are only surrounded by women. That's one That's one side. It's also a very an emotional space, right? You're welcoming a new life. You're under a lot of stress. Mm. In the West Bank, there's something to think, consider in this, which is that, they are under stress. These women are under stress because they are um, giving birth in, in general. But then there is all this background stress as well, right? The situation that they find themselves in, the situation they had to go through to get to the hospital and what will life be like on their way back from the hospital uh, for the new child that they've just birthed. Um, so there are these layers of different stress. And I think that women are, are, you know, I find maternity wards very interesting. Both midwives and the women are very open, and and there is a lot of discussion about life and, and what's going on there, and and in in many ways in its truest form, I think. Hmm. Wow, well, this gets lost, I think, and when you read stories like this, because there's just so so much violence and heartbreak. But what we're talking about here is is women going to hospitals to welcome a new life. It's supposed to be such a momentous occasion, obviously not easy for a lot of people, but an amazing experience. And yet they have to deal with all of these other factors that so many people can't even fathom. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that these midwives do an amazing job. And, you know, as we say as well, a lot of them working now um, without salary. Um, but this is the job they do. This is the job they chose to do. Um and healthcare workers in general, uh, they, they just keep going, don't they? That's the other question, Lindsay, is I was wondering, how, how are these families getting by? Because as you say, they have not received full salaries for months now. You report, as part of a 1994 economic deal, Israel collects taxes for Palestinians and is supposed to transfer them every month to the Palestinian Authority, which pays the salaries of public health workers. But for years, Israel has used the tax revenue as a political bargaining chip. And since the start of the war, has been refusing to hand over the portion of tax revenues allocated to Gaza. In protest, the Palestinian Authority in February refuse to accept any tax revenue at all. And so how are people getting by? And do you have any idea when they will start being paid? Yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, several of the midwives I spoke to had not received any salary uh, for months. Um, many of them had not received their full salary since since November 2021, or they'd only been receiving between 50 and 70 percent of their salary. Um, and this is not just the midwives. This is all uh, employees under the Ministry of Public Health. Um, and it is particularly difficult for midwives like Naveen, who, who we, you mentioned earlier, whose husband is, is a nurse. So both of them are healthcare workers and, and uh, now currently both without their salaries and with young kids at home. Um, so... Yeah, there's an incredible strain on all of these healthcare workers uh, and all of these ministry of, ministry of health employees right now with their with these salaries. Lindsay, are you still in touch with any of these women? Yeah, I'm still I'm still in touch with them. One one uh, texted me the other day. Actually, she said she was in the. She said I'm in the back of the ambulance. My relative uh just gave birth in the back of the ambulance and we it took us an hour and a half to get to the hospital and i said how long does it usually take you to get to the hospital and she said 20 minutes so <laughs> this is the this is the 
one show of like how these kind of like blockades and and temporary checkpoints and obstructions to the roads just absolutely blocks this kind of access from from all fronts um but luckily uh her relative and her new her new nephew are, are safe and well but yeah i'm still in touch with all of them um yeah well Lindsay, once again thank you so much for your important reporting and thank you for joining us thanks for having me rose Take Thank care. you. You too. Take care. Lindsay Billing wrote about her reporting trip in a Mother Jones piece called West Bank Midwives Are Facing a Maternal Health Crisis. The piece also includes a number of beautiful photos taken by Lindsay Billing. You can find the piece at KALW.org. Click on News and then Your Call. Coming up after a break, we will talk about a ProPublica investigation focusing on a Christian right group called Ziklag. They are working to sway the election in favor of Donald Trump. This is Your Calls Media Roundtable. We'll be back after this.